morning, everybody. Thank you for coming. Uh, this morning we have a special guest to talk about the X1 and other things. It's Mr. Cam Martin. Uh, Cam has uh, lectured at various places, including the Smithsonian, the National Museum of Naval Aviation, and the American Airlines C.R. Smith Museum. He is a commercial uh, glider pilot who restores and flies vintage sailplanes. He's an EAA Young Eagles flight leader, and since 2012, he has served as EAA's chaplain and is a trained critical wisdom responder. He retired from the NASA Flight Research Center after 40 years of aerospace communications career. Thank you very much for being able to visit us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for squeezing me in to what uh, to what your normal schedule is. Uh, I'm here today for for a number of reasons. I'll give you a couple. I speak at Oshkosh, uh, the the air show week there. Uh, I have probably done 200 presentations at Oshkosh uh, in the decades that I have been going. Uh, and when I saw that the uh, that the 75th anniversary of uh, the Mach 1 flight was coming up, I uh, I called the scheduler. And said, uh, and said, hey, I'm speaking, but you want to know when I want to speak. Uh, I want to speak when the X1 presentation is not being given because it's the 75th anniversary coming up and I want to go to the X1 time. And he said, uh, he said oh, well, uh, uh, that's not a factor because, uh, because there is no X1 talk at Oshkosh this year. Mm -hmm. And I said, it's the eve of the 75th anniversary. NASA is working on the X-59 supersonic, uh, you know, supersonic low boom uh, research airplane. NASA is going to be there. NASA is not doing an X-1 talk. And he said, no, it's a 75th anniversary of the United States Air Force. Without the Bell X-1, you know, would there really be a U.S. Air Force? The, the Air Force has to be doing one. He said, no, the Air Force is not doing a talk. Before my brain caught up with my mouth, I said, well, would you like me to give an X-1 talk? And he said, would you please? So I did an X1 talk. At the end of that X1 presentation, a gentleman came up and handed me a business card and said, uh, I am the chief of the curators for the National Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C. that has the X1. Would you please come and give that talk? So that is, uh, so that's the genesis of what you're about to hear. Jim Kidrick was at an event up in the Antelope Valley uh, not quite a year ago. And in talking to Jim, I said, hey, I have an X1 talk. I'd be happy to share it. And he said, absolutely, you come down and do that. And so, uh, and so Dudley and I have been negotiating schedules ever since to try uh, to, to try to find a slot for, to do this. Uh, this is uh, October 5th. October 14th will be the 76th anniversary of the first X1 flight. And, uh, and so while it's still the 75th anniversary year, and I don't have to change my slides, I want to get in under the wire and say, here, this is the 75th anniversary time of, uh, of, the, of the Bell X-1. Uh, so I, uh, I want to thank you all for the turnout. I didn't get a chance to talk to you all individually, but thank you for coming. I was, uh, I was going to call it a good day if five people showed up. So thank you so much for coming. Uh, this is a museum that I have, uh, I, I have a strong affinity for. Uh, when I first came to San Diego wearing a Navy uniform, uh, the Globe Theater had just burned and this museum had just been uh, had just been decimated and there wasn't an air and space museum then. And so I know the Phoenix rising from the ashes story from that perspective. I really wanted to go to an air and space museum. There wasn't one here. The, uh, the sheer audacity of this place just warms my heart. If there's something that this museum wants to exhibit, and it doesn't exist. You build one. Uh, you built a GB. I mean, never mind that you built a Spirit of St. Louis. Other people have built replicas of the Spirit of St. Louis, but you have a Spirit of St. Louis. You have a GB. Uh, I went for years thinking the Boeing P 26 P shooter is such a cool airplane. It's a shame that there aren't any and you can't see one anyplace. And you built one. And, uh, and, then, uh, and then all the X 1s are spoken for. Uh, they built six, three blew up. Uh, they're all in, you know, the ones that are surviving are on display. You built an X-1. And so it's, uh, so it's kind of like that Jurassic Park story where you get back to the original DNA and you, uh, and you create whatever doesn't exist. And, uh, and better than Jurassic Park, the stuff you make does not eat your visitors. So that's a good so, so thing. <laughs> on the why me thing. Uh, 1988, I got invited to go work for NASA Langley Research Center in Hampton, Virginia. They were the mother center. 
And, uh, and I had just discovered Jay Miller's book, X-Planes, that went through all of the X-Planes up to X-29. And then the next edition of that went to X-31. Well, in Virginia, uh, in Virginia, I got the vanity license plate X-Planes. And a few years later, I had the opportunity to come work for NASA's Flight Research Center here at Edwards. And I came to California. I had to get a California plate. And I was amazed to learn that, uh, that no one in the entire state of California wanted the license plate X-Planes. So I got X-Planes again. Uh, I just counted back on my fingers. I have had that vanity plate for 35 years in two states. I spent, my, I, I spent my NASA career working external affairs, government relations, public affairs, and, uh, and so uh, one day my boss was following me out the gate at Langley. And when he saw me at work the next day, he says, uh, you're our public affairs guy. And he said, I am. And he said, I just saw your license plate. And I said, yeah. And he said, I just broke the code. It's a noun and a verb. You explain things to people. And I said, yes, that's me. <laughs> when I saw your flyer for me and, and it said X-Planes expert, I cringed a little bit. Because, uh, because my role at NASA, it was my job to know who the X-Planes experts were. Uh, and I would, create, uh, I would create symposia where we would invite uh, Chuck Yeager and Dick Hallian and, uh, and Scott Crossfield and the luminaries who actually put fingerprints on this history. Uh, I would bring those people in so that we could hear from them. Uh, and so I didn't consider myself an X-Planes expert. And then I thought, well, in the years that you worked at NASA, what was actually uh, what was actually at Edwards flying? And I thought, well, uh, I've seen the X-29 fly. I've seen the X-31 fly. Uh, the uh, X-32 and X-35, those should have been uh, the YFs, but they put Xs on them for marketing, I guess. Uh, uh, I saw a mock-up of the X-33 fly. We did captive carries of the X-34. Uh, I was there when we flew the X-38, the X-45, uh, the X-48, the X-40, the X-53. So when I went down that list, it's like, well, uh, I was working at the place that flew them and any chance I could, uh, I would get out and uh, watch the flight or slip into the control room. So, uh, so, that kind of, uh, so that kind of puts me in the same category as the guy who sleeps in the Holiday Inn Express the night before he comes out of the same so with that, um, uh, I'll actually get into my uh, get into my talk here. Richard P. Hallian and Dick Hallian. Uh, this is still the foundational benchmark book for both the X1 and the uh, and the D558 programs. The follow-on to that was written by Louis Rotundo, and after I read the first book, it's like, who is this guy, and why would he write this book? This goes into a deep dive, and picks up where Hallian leaves off on how things go. And, uh, and something to understand about the X-1, uh, about the X-1 program is the X-1 was the first airplane built to be a research tool. There were record airplanes, there were planes that set altitude records, planes that set speed records, but the X-1 was built because they could not get data of what happens between Mach 0.8 and Mach 1.3. There was this dropout and you couldn't get accurate data from the wind tunnels at the time. And, uh, and so the airplane was built as a research tool. And when this was built as a research tool, the, uh, uh, the U.S. had just unequivocally uh, emerged victorious out of World War II and then saw that there were technologies that existed that we were not on top of. Uh, swept wings, uh, that came from someplace else. Uh, the turbojet engine, that came from someplace else. And, uh, and it was clear that, that airplanes were going to fly faster into a region that we did not understand and we needed a tool. Not only did we need the tool, the Air Force was now recognizing that it had no experimental test pilots. Uh, it actually got out of the flight research, flight test business uh, in about 1926. So the Air Force had no, had no cadre of test pilots. Uh, so, so this was new territory for them. It was new territory for the NACA because uh, because they had uh, they had not done fundamental research with airplanes before. Uh, they knew how to get flight data. They knew how to get wind tunnel data, but uh, but they hadn't done this before. And Bell, the contractors, the airframe contractors, the consolidators, the North Americans, all of those companies, these were accustomed to having company test pilots. Lockheed, Tony Levere. Um, 
uh, company test pilots would do all the heavy lifting and then hand the airplane over uh, to the services who were buying them. So you have these three players in the mix. It was a knife fight and nobody knew what the rules were for a knife fight. Nobody knew what the contractor's job was. Nobody knew what the military's job was. Nobody knew what the civilian agency's job was. And so all of those things of who's going to do what gets sorted out. And so, uh, so Rotundo's book will, will give you kind of a peek in under the tent of, well, what's going on and what are they trying to sort out? Okay. Uh, the Smithsonian did their own book, Chuck Yeager and the Bell X-1. They did one that was, uh, that was uh, Lindbergh and the Spirit of St. Louis. So they had a series like this. Frank Winter, uh, Bob Vanderlinden, uh, Linder, and uh, Don Pisano. They did a great job on this book. So one more. Okay. So 20th century aerospace milestones, the way we in, uh, we in the United States tell the story of the first century of aerospace in, uh, uh, in four chapters for, for what happens in the 20th century. And for any of the people who come up to you when you're wearing your red blazer and they want to talk to you about, uh, uh, and, they, you know, and they want to talk to you about stuff in the museum, they want to hear the stories. Uh, if you show them this chart and you say, uh, what's their last name? Uh, they can tell. What's the name of the airplane? They can tell you. What's the name of the milestone? They can tell you for every one of these, you know, that they can get you to the eagle has landed. The people you talk to generally have that much of the story and you all dream it. You know, this is all common knowledge. With that, everybody has their favorite version of each of these stories. Uh, most people don't know that uh, the Orville Wright uh, flew the first flight on December 17th because Wilbur won the toss on December 14th and then broke the airplane. Uh, so, you know, so the older brother doesn't get to be the first person to fly. Most people don't know the story at that level, but, uh, but, but they know that, uh, but they know something about the right one. With the Bell X-1, people have their favorite pieces of that story. Anybody ever read uh, bedtime stories to a young person? Uh, you tell the story of the three bears and, uh, and you get the Goldilocks and the porridge and the Goldilock and the chairs too hard thing in the wrong place, you're in trouble. Uh, and so, uh, and so what I'm going to share with you is the Goldilocks and the Three Bears version of the X-1 story. Uh, because everybody who comes to hear it from you and, and look at your replica is, uh, you know, is going to be listening for those things. Okay, so this is Chuck Yeager himself with Glamorous, uh, with Glamorous Glen, not Glamorous Glenis, this is Glamorous Glen. X-1 is named for, uh, named for this, uh, named for the series of airplanes that he named for his wife. Uh, Chuck Yeager's uh, 100th birthday would have been February 13th of this year. There is currently a uh, Chuck Yeager Sting Up initiative underway. If you haven't seen it, you can Google Chuck Yeager Flying Magazine, and uh, and you'll get the address for who to lend your, uh, who to send your, uh, who to send your letters for, uh, to create that stand. So. Uh, this is still the X-1 Supersonic 75th. I want to acknowledge some of the people who have done the heavy lifting so that we comprehend this story the way it is. First and foremost yeah, is my friend, uh, Dr. Dick Hallian. If you email Dick Hallian, you'll know that his email is Dr. Hypersonic. He pioneered this story. In 1969, <clears throat> as an undergraduate in college, he had to do a research thesis and he picked the Bell X-1 in 1969. In 1969, all of the documents for this were buried in archives. They haven't been sent to federal record centers where people who don't speak airplane decide which piece of paper to keep and which one to throw out. So he got raw material and the people who did this were still alive. Uh, that's why his book, Supersonic Flight, is such a valuable story with the details because the people, the records were, he, would, he had access to the records, he had access to the people and uh, did a masterful job getting them. He writes this thesis in, in 1969 and then goes to Michael Collins, the, the upcoming director of the National Air and Space Museum and says, you know, the 25th anniversary of the supersonic flight is coming. The Smithsonian ought to do something to observe that. And, and Michael Collins said, oh, what a great idea. Why don't you write a book? And so, uh, and so the book I showed you, uh, Hallian wrote in, uh, in 1972, just before, uh, just before that 25th anniversary. So the story existed uh, in an academically footnoted form. Uh, and so Michael Collins said, uh, said uh, hey Dick, uh, uh, I would like to hire you as, uh, as one of our curators 
for the up and coming National Air and Space Museum. So in 1974, Dick Hallian comes onto the staff of the yet to open National Air and Space Museum and creates their high speed flight flight research exhibits. That is what he is the curator of. So standing on his shoulders, uh, Tony Landis did a lot of the graphics that I was going to show you on this. And the epic photos, that, uh, the close-up photos of the X-1 were taken by Eric Long, who has, uh, who has just, uh, just retired from the Smithsonian. Classic photographer. Okay, um, so October 14th, 1947, we have this. Uh, this is all locked in. When you see these photos of the X-1, this is a 1947 photo. Uh, the Air Force decided that they needed other publicity photos, and so they took some later on, and you can tell the early photos and the later photos because the, the X-1 is all orange in this, and, when, and later on in the X-1's career, uh, this tunnel is painted white, that tunnel is painted white, and the rudder is painted white. But you know, so this is a, so this is the 1947 version of the photo. So everybody knows Chuck Yeager X1 one milestone. Uh, Bert Rutan's older brother Dick Rutan used to have a bar bet question, and it would be, okay, so who was the second person to fly supersonically? And uh, and he won a lot of beers from people uh, doing that. And uh, so for your benefit, first person to fly supersonically, uh, first airplane, uh, second airplane to fly super. Herb Hoover. NACA test pilot flies the NACA's X1 uh, 6063. And, uh, and so that is March of 1948. He is the second person to fly supersonically, uh, Mach 1.065. And this is the slower of the X1s. This one had a thicker wing than Glennis. One more slide. And then before the end of that month, Howard Tick Lilly, uh, another NACA uh, test pilot flies the uh, same airplane. The Air Force flew 6062, uh, and the NACA had access to 6063. So those are, uh, so that's one, two, and three flying them. One of the fractured fairy tale stories that, uh, that, that tends to circulate was that, was that North American aviation test pilot Wheaties Welch dived an XP-86A supersonic before Chuck Yeager breaks the sound barrier. Uh, and that is a popular, I've got a, t uh, got a secret story. That's sort of like Whitehead flew before the rights. Uh, it just, uh, it, it's the story that will never die. And that's unfortunate because it is just flat out wrong. The XP-86A that was flying in October of that year had, a, uh, had an early J-35 engine in it. The uh, Korean War combat uh, F-86s that could routinely dive supersonically had, uh, had J-47s, had more thrust. Uh, in between those two, there was an upgraded J-35 installed in one of those XP-86 uh, prototypes. And on uh, April 26, 1948, North American aviation test pilot George Welch did indeed dive, uh, dive an F-86 uh, faster than the speed of sound. And part of the reason we know that is the Air Force went to the NACA and said, could you please instrument these airplanes and start collecting data for us? Because, because flight data is one thing, that's what the NACA does, uh, indicated from the instrument panel, that's what test pilots do. So, uh, so could you please give us the, the honest and hitting truth of, uh, of what that was? And so, uh, and so that was why uh, uh, April 26, 1948. Nobody argues about that. Hi. Since you're not even talking about rumors and things like that, what about the story about Bob Hoover and Chuck Hager? Uh, Chuck Hager having. I have that story. I'll get, get to you. I'll get there. Was doing test, he was doing chase uh, for the X1 when, when Chuck broke the record, but Bob Hoover would have been the pilot to break the. Uh, this I'll get there. Here. I'll get there. That's part oh, of what I'm sure. You're going to get there. I'm, sure. I'm getting there. Uh, I'm, I'm getting there. The best place to get Bob Hoover's version of that story, in Bob Hoover's own words, is uh, is in the documentary Flying the Feathered Edge. And that was done by uh, uh, King First was the one who did the interviews and created that documentary. But, uh, but the short version of the story was, uh, was Hoover was on the X-1 program, went flat hatting uh, as a request uh, a friend of his asked him to do a certain spectacular flight to impress somebody. He got caught, and uh, and Al Boyd uh, and Al Boyd changed the sequence of who was going to do what. 
So, uh, so yeah, uh, there's uh, apparently uh, apparently Bob Hoover was supposed to fly uh, was supposed to fly that supersonic milestone. And if you know Bob Hoover's career, uh, it destroyed him. Nobody ever heard of this guy again. He had a horrible career. In the the Bell X One supersonic data trace, October fourteenth, nineteen forty seven. Bob Hoover took this picture. He was flying an F P eighty, a photo wrecking version uh, of the shooting star. And his job was to do the high-speed chase. There was a low-speed chase that hung with the bomber. There was a high-speed chase guy that was at altitude out in front of the B-29. And, uh, and what Bob Hoover would do, yes, he would take off after everybody else. And the B-29 mothership was getting up to altitude. The launch altitude was about 25,000 feet. Uh, as they were getting up to altitude just to let everybody on the team know that he had arrived, uh, he would come... Uh, he would come full throttle about 10 feet under uh, under the B-29, and here's Jaeger in the X-1 hanging in the shackles. It's a bomb shackle. He would do high-speed pass 10 feet under the bomber and whack the bottom of the bomber so that everybody knew that the high-speed chase had arrived. And then he would sprint out ahead of the, uh, of the B-29 about 10 miles ahead at about 40,000 feet where he was making a contrail, and that was Chuck Jaeger's aim point. Uh, visibility out of the X-1 wasn't that great. So there was this FP-80 dragging a contrail higher and in front of the bomber. That was Jaeger's aim point. Uh, when Jaeger comes past Hoover, uh, Hoover trips the, uh, trips the shutter uh, on the camera and gets this picture. It may or may not have been on October 14th, but since the Wright brothers' picture was honest to goodness on December 17th, everybody treats this as if it was honest to goodness that flight. There were flights on either side of that. It could have been any of those, but, uh, but we use it this way. What you can see in this particular picture is there's, uh, there's four rocket chambers on the XLR-11 engine. Only one of them is, uh, is ignited here. And, uh, and if you look, uh, this is not a smudge on the negative. Uh, number two engine on the B-29 exhaust uh, belches out right onto the top of the wing here. And that's just an artifact of the, uh, of the engine itself. This is the supersonic trace from the supersonic flight, October 14th. This little divot here and this little divot here, that is the shock wave going over uh, the pressure port on this. And, and, and if you know, uh, you know the shape of shock waves, they're cone-shaped, so the shock wave is here. Uh, the supersonic flow shock wave is here. It's a cone, so it doesn't catch either one of these. So this is off of the this is off of the probe on the nose, and this is only 10 or 15 seconds worth of data. They were not supersonic very long. Uh, got supersonic, then you got the data point, and uh, and wrapped things up and came back. So uh, Mach 1.06, uh, 700 miles an hour, uh, 43,000 feet. Everybody likes to tell the story that they were on the ground and they heard the boom. NASA has been, ever since, uh, ever since Chuck Yeager broke the sound barrier, NASA has been hard at work trying to fix it. And uh, the team that is currently trying to understand acoustics of, uh, of what's going on, uh, what's going on with sound waves in the air, how do we keep from booming people on the ground so that we can fly fast and not irritate, uh, and not irritate the non-participants? All of our understanding of the sonic boom as, it as we understand it today is that the balloon soundings from that day said there was a headwind. That makes it hard to hear stuff on the ground. The balloon soundings came from Edwards and from Bakersfield. We have with 105% confidence that that boom never reached the ground. For that boom to, for acoustically, for that boom to reach the ground, he would have needed to go at least Mach 1.2, and he only got to 1.06. Uh, they had radar tracking data, they had flight data, they know what he did. So people on the ground did not hear that boom. And when you would get, when they would do oral histories about, oh, did you hear the boom? You would have, uh, you would have people who were sure they were there that day, and they would say, oh yeah, uh, I saw the flash, and then I heard the boom. And they went, no, 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 no. That's atomic testing in a different state. <laughs> so uh, oral histories are great, but they have their limitations. Bell X-1, October 14th. So this is the pilot's report from that day. Uh, and this is where Yeager goes through uh, the, the things that he is most interested in communicating in this. Uh, one of the things in this pilot report, I'm there with a fully loaded Bell X-1 full of fuel. The B-29 has been struggling to get to altitude. The engines are overtent. 
It was brutal for B-29s to lift any of these rocket planes up to a launch altitude. They barely get to 25,000 feet. They finally get on condition. The X-1 pilot wants the B-29 to lower the nose and dive, and the pilots are going, but that's going to overspeed my propellers. So there's this corner thing of, you want to go fast. This is about as fast as I want to go. And so the first thing that Chad Binger is registering in here is, is well, launch me at 250 miles an hour. This was slower than desired, which being translated means I was stalled, guys. Thanks a lot. And then the next thing he's reporting on is I get fast and this uh, all moving uh, elevator, uh, that uh, all moving stabilizer thing, that's working. And then he talks about it jumping off the scale. So this is what the instrument face in the X-1 looked like on that day. Uh, this is not the original for the 50th anniversary of the supersonic flight. Uh, they put a bunch of these instrument faces into the F-15 that he flew uh, the reenactment flight in. And then, uh, and then when he got back and landed, uh, they were signed by General Yeager. They were numbered. They were turned over uh, to the Flight Test Museum Foundation to, uh, uh, to auction off as, uh, as fundraisers. Uh, museums do fundraisers. Yes. What was the, the disappointment of his drop speed of 250 knots from the B-29, is that because he only had like 17 seconds of fuel and he would not be able to get the speed he wanted? No, uh, uh, most, of this, uh, most of us who fly like to fly airplanes that are not, uh, that, that are not on the verge of incipient spins. Okay. Uh, you know, you stall and spin and bad things happen and yeah. you just like to have an airplane that was flying. So, uh, so, so it wasn't the lack of, uh, so it wasn't, it wasn't lack of fuel. It was, uh, I need to be, you know, I can't do anything meaningful with this airplane. So he's diving away from the B-29 to get the flying speed. And once he gets the flying speed, he can get wings level. And once he can get wings level, he can start to ignite the rocket chambers. So, and, uh, and, and, uh, pilots, when they would, uh, uh, the, the B-29, uh, you know, you're in the womb of this bomber and it's nice and dark and your eyes are adjusted to the dark. Uh, and then, uh, and then they drop you, and suddenly you're in blinding sunshine, and you're just like a mole. So your eyes are trying to adjust to daylight. You know, you can't really read the instruments. You know, it's just, uh, it, it's just, uh, pilots like to be faster. That's all. Okay. So, uh, and then the other thing Jaeger would say was, oh, when they put the Mach meter in the X1, they didn't have a lot of confidence in it, so they only gave us a Mach meter that went to 1.0. That was as fast as the calibrations went. So when you read in here, he is estimating, well, how fast did you actually get? Uh, it's estimated that 1.05 Mach was attained uh, at this time. Uh, approximately 30% of the fuel and liquid oxygen remained uh, and turned the motor off. So, uh, so, that's the, so that's that first flight. Okay, so uh, the, United, uh, the United States the National Air and Space Museum is, uh, is undergoing a seven-year renovation. It began in 2018, and, uh, and so they're reworking everything downtown in Washington, D.C. Uh, they took the Bell X-1 from its, uh, from its usual display in the Milestones of Flight Gallery. They put it on the gear for the first time since 1950, and this is out at Udverhazi. And, uh, and Eric Long had the opportunity to do some spectacular photography of the airplane. Uh, and so uh, I, wanted to, uh, I wanted to just give you uh, an up close and personal uh, walkthrough of some of these photos so that, you, so that you get the sense, if you haven't seen the airplane on the deer, uh, what it's looking like. The fuselage of the X-1, it's 31 feet long. And, uh, and for comparison, it's one foot shorter than a P-51 Mustang. It's one foot longer than the Bell P-39 Eric Cobra, so it's kind of fighter-sized length on the fuselage. Uh, and Chuck Yeager flew all three. He flew the P-39, he flew the P-51, uh, and he also, uh, he also flew this one. Uh, so you always hear the story about, oh, it was, uh, it was shaped like a 50 caliber machine gun bullet uh, because they knew from the, gunnery, uh, from the gunnery work with that, it had a very small dispersion on the target, which meant that it was accurate, which meant that the bullet didn't tumble. We don't want the airplane to tumble. We like the shape of that bullet. Let's use the Ogine. When, when people tell that story, you get to see the front of the X-1 and they'll put it side by side with a 50 caliber bullet still in the brass. And, uh, and so you get the, so you, nobody tells it this way, but you get the sense that they're talking about this much of the X-1. Okay, you can go to the next. And if you look, 
so if you uh, if you look here, you see that it is not just the ogive on the front. It is the whole darn round, 50 caliber armor cushion round that we're looking at there. But you just get the sense of it is the whole fuselage uh, that you're talking about. And then there's a little boat tail on the back. And uh, the windscreen is the next part of the story. They came up with the lowest drag windscreen they could. But they didn't want to disrupt that ogive shape. Uh, but if you see here, uh, this is the pilot's eye view looking out. And, uh, and you could see that uh, the pilot visibility was really limited. Bell built a wooden mock-up of the cockpit. They had their test pilot, Jack Willits, sit in it. And, uh, and they asked him, said, well, you know, uh, will that work? And he said, uh, yeah, yeah, I can make that work. Well, the pilot could not see anything within five miles uh, when he was getting to land. Visibility was uh, was not great. That was a design compromise that was made. And Jack Woolham's first flight uh, of the Bell X-1, which is at what we would know as Orlando International Airport today, it was called Pine Castle then, was a 10,000 foot long runway. And uh, visibility out of the airplane was you know, judged to be adequate when you're sitting in a wooden mock-up, but it probably had something to do with the fact that on the first flight of the X-1, Jack Willems landed 400 feet short of the runway. Lake beds are your friend. Okay, uh, one more. Okay, control you. Here's a close-up again from Eric Long of uh, the panel in the Bell X-1. You have a replica of this panel uh, downstairs with your, uh, with your exhibit. Here is the mock meter. And, uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. But your Mach meter looks exactly like the Mach meter that is there in the Smithsonian's airplane. Uh, here is the control yoke. You'll see it wasn't a fighter pilot's control stick like, uh, like any you know, self-respecting fighter pilot wants. It is a yoke because there were, there were no power-boosted controls on this airplane. Uh, and they weren't sure what the loads were going to be on the, uh, on the flight controls. So they put a bomber yoke in it. Uh, and they didn't want the pilot to have to, uh, to mess around much. So there is a thrust selector, a data switch, uh, your stabilizer controls, because again, the airplane is designed at high speed. You can fly it by stabilizer instead of elevator if you need to. And then your power shutoff controls. So everything that the pilot actually positively, absolutely needed to have access to in any flight configuration uh, was located right here so that he didn't have to, he didn't have to, didn't have to reach very far. One more. Okay, Mach meter. So here, uh, after, uh, after they knew that the airplane would go faster than Mach 1, they put a different, uh, they put a different instrument face on the Mach meter, set it up so that, uh, uh, so that you could see exactly what was going on. The fastest uh, flight of Glamorous Glenis was Mach 1.46 over here. So they never ran it off the scale again. But, that's, uh, but this, is the, this is the style of instrument face that you have uh, downstairs in your lobby. Everybody loves the story about the broken ribs, the broomstick, and the hatch. And to his credit, since we have all heard this story, Eric Long made a point of when the airplane was down off the ceiling and you could actually access it, he did, uh, he specifically went in, here's the, here's the pilot's seat for the X-1, uh, here is that hatch. And uh, I'm a Navy guy. And so every time I heard this story about, oh, had to have a chunk of broomstick to wrench on the latch to close everything up, I am, amaz I am imagining a watertight door on a ship that has a circular thing that you have to rotate. So in my mind, for years, uh, I always imagined that what Chuck Yeager was doing was sticking that broomstick in and, uh, and, doing, uh, and doing a rotary motion on, uh, on a rotating thing. This is a standard over center latch. It is just a straight down pole to latch it. So, uh, you know, anybody, uh, anybody who has ever had a retractable gear on a general aviation airplane, you have an over center latch like this. So this is where Chuck Yeager is sticking, sticking the broom handle and it's down to latch it. And then these are the, uh, these are the rotating, yeah, these are the rotating pieces that engage around the edges. It's a pressurized cockpit, so it's important that you know it's it's important to get a force on that because you have to seal this, because the cockpit of the Bell X1 is pressurized with nitrogen, not oxygen. It's a nitrogen environment. The pilot can't breathe in the cockpit. He is absolutely dependent on uh, on what's being fed to him through his nose. And the other important thing in this is this is the pressure relief valve. Once you get this thing pressurized. Uh, you have this pressurized nitrogen set up in the cockpit. 
uh, you have to depressurize. You have to depressurize this before you can open the door. And uh, Slick Goodwin, Bell test pilot, the, the pressure dump valve that was supposed to regulate the cockpit pressure was not venting nitrogen the way it needed to. And he was in the cockpit, door latched, belly of the bomber, and he is watching his altitude indications go lower and lower and lower. And by the time the bomber gets to 23,000 feet, the pressure altitude in the cockpit is 1,000 feet below sea level. And I don't know what's going through his mind, but you only have so much pressure in the oxygen mask, the pressure around you is getting a lot higher. And this valve does not work, it malfunctions. And so they abort the flight and he has to dump the pressure. He has to dump the pressure out of his cockpit before something genuinely bad happens. And so with full pressure and then some in the cockpit, he opens this latch and shoots this door off like it's out of a champagne cork. It bangs into the ladder that he just rode down, a little elevator ladder in the bomber. Uh, it bends that ladder, it bends this door, and it wedges between the Bell X-1 and the ladder. And he is looking out the door, and all he can see is, is 23,000 feet of freefall uh, to the ground. And the bomber crew says, you want to get out of the X-1? He says, no, I'll sit right here till you land. And that in itself was gutsy because there's only this much clearance between the belly of the X-1 and the runway. But so he rode it out. But anyhow, uh, just a lot of things in this airplane that weren't trivial. But if you ever hear about Slick Goodwin and uh, and shooting the door off because it was pressurized, it was not. Uh, it was not a lapse of memory on his part. It was. Uh, it was something that was done very intentionally because they had a they had a problem in the flight. Ken, what was the part, uh, reason for the uh, uh, the H two uh, pressurization because of condensation? Uh, nitrogen? No. Uh, nitrogen. Uh, uh, the question was. Uh, the question was, why are you pressurizing with nitrogen? They needed to pressurize the cockpit with something. All the auxiliaries in the airplane were on high pressure nitrogen. They had a lot of high pressure nitrogen. And if you remember the Apollo 1, Apollo 204 fire, it's just better. Uh, it's safer for the pilot. Uh, it's safer for the pilot to be in an all nitrogen environment for fire. And you had a rocket engine in the back and everybody was afraid of rocket engine. So, uh, so yeah, so that's what that was. Straight wing on the airplane, eight or 10% thickness to cord. That's how thick is the airfoil. This is about a seven and a half inch thick airfoil with the weight root. And this was because there was a debate over how thick do you make the airfoil with me? All of the, all of the high speed diving issues that they had with fighter planes in, uh, in World War II. The Germans' first fatality for uh, compressibility in a dive was 1937 in an early Messerschmitt 109. Our first experience was that with was in 1941 uh, with a P-38. But uh, but everybody knew that a fat airfoil on a fighter wing uh, was going to get you into trouble transonically. So there was a debate over how thick do we make this wing. John Stack, who was part of part of the team, uh, NACA John Stack said, well. Uh, well, we know that we know that thick airfoils uh, have really bad flight characteristics. So he was advocating for a 12% thick wing, because he said we're building this as a research tool. We want to get we want to get into where the problems are. Let's put a 12% thick wing on it. And uh, and this is an engineer sitting at a desk. This is not the pilot who's going to have to fly this. So there's a debate over how bad do you make the wing. Uh, meanwhile, Bell is supposed to be building an 18G wing. Fighter planes were stressed to 7Gs. This was an 18G airframe. And so Bell is going, how in the world do we make something that thin uh, and stress it to 18Gs? So, uh, so they built a 10% wing and that went to the NACA's airplane eventually. Uh, when, when Jaeger breaks the sound area, he's flying an 8% thick wing. And uh, it's kind of hard to see, but there is a spoiler here on top of the wing, just like you'd find on a sailplane. There was a hope that they could fly these flights out of, uh, out of Hampton, Virginia, off of, uh, off of the Langley Air Force Base runway that was used by the NACA at Langley, uh, which, which was co-located. And as things went on, uh, you weren't going to fly this over populated areas. When it came out here to the high desert and you have a 44 square mile lake bed, you didn't need, uh, you didn't have any spoilers. Okay. Excuse me, Gail. Sir. When you're talking about the wing, why didn't we learn from the German data and have a swept wing? Was it for strength that they went with a strength? Uh, I'll get there. A okay. And what was the pressure altitude for him in the cockpit itself? 
at altitude. You know, most of them, you know, they'll take you to eight to twenty three, yeah. twenty five uh, thousand, and then it's incrementally up. And I haven't seen that. I don't know. Uh, That's just curious because you know they have a yeah, oxygen mask, positive breathing, and you know, certain out it forces. Positive yeah. Positive. yeah, and I don't. Uh, I don't know that I don't know that World War II fighter technology was working on you know, on pressure bonding. I think that that was a I think that that was a jet age. Yeah, I think that was a jet age thing. Uh, you know, we learned a lot of things the hard way, and that might be on that list. Okay, adjustable horizontal tail. One of the fractured fairy tales that uh, that you'll get is that uh, right before Jaeger's flight. Jack Ridley, uh, the flight test engineer who was assigned to the program, that Jack Ridley and Chuck Yeager sneak into a hangar and they MacGyver an adjustable tail on the airplane. People like that story. I uh, heard that one from a Smithsonian curator. Uh, not a curator, uh, docent. Smithsonian docent said, well, what about when these guys snuck into the hangar and, and uh, you know, and, and, made, uh, and made the tail, you know, did the all-flying stabilizer. And that never happened. This was a design requirement introduced onto the Bell contract by the NACA, saying from the detrimental effects of high-speed dives and fighters, we know the pilots are losing elevator control. Uh, we want to be able to move this entire surface. So this thing was built with 15 degrees of travel, and it was, uh, and it was operated by a motor that would generate one degree per second change in that. And, uh, and as they progressed with the flight test, closer to Jaeger's flight, they said, no, it's going to be a lot better if we, uh, if we put a faster motor on it. So they ultimately moved this, uh, they swapped it out, and so they changed the surface to be a three degree per second uh, movement on that. And what Jaeger and Ridley were doing was going out into the hangar, lubricating that, playing with it, making sure they knew exactly how it worked. And Ridley wrote the control schedule for Jaeger, saying, uh, at this speed, you should move the stabilizer about this much so that they had an understanding of it. But, uh, but the airplane was designed from the ground up to have that feature as, uh, as, part, of the, uh, as part of the safety for the airplane. So his wheel didn't act with that. What's that? No, he had to have a, there was a toggle. So that was just doing the elevator at the back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So th th that did the elevator, and then he had a toggle switch there on that yoke. So in a weird sort of way, this is the first advent of the UHT, a unit horizontal tail? Uh, in a weird sort of way? Well, except that Wilbur and Orville had an all moving. Yeah. I've been like, it's, it's just, yeah. it's, yeah. yeah. So it's, you know, everybody, you know, it, you see different things different ways for different purposes. High horizontal tail. Uh, again, P38, uh, P38 shockwaves that come off the wing impinge, uh, impinge the elevator. Oh, what happens in a high speed dive? You get a shockwave on top of the wing. Behind the shockwave on the top of the wing, uh, it destroys all the lift. So your wing is no longer lifting. So, you know, you're in an airplane and the wing isn't lifting, the nose goes down. So that's bad. But then double bad is the wing wake. All of this turbulent flow is coming off, and if your uh, and if your stabilizer and elevator are in line with your wing, not only is your wing not helping you by not lifting, but now you don't have any elevator control to get the nose up. So you can't get the nose up. You can't slow down. You can't pull out of the dive. Uh, you make craters. So the NACA said, put a high horizontal tail on this dead above the wing wake. So that's so that's why that is located where it is. And uh, this is the and this is the business end of the X one. Okay, intended for ground takeoff. So Larry Bell said, "I want a nose gear on this thing, because Germans had a Messerschmitt 163 rocket interceptor could take off and go straight up and shoot the bomber and come straight back down." And he's thinking maybe there's a niche for a point defense interceptor. Maybe we could arm one of these things and put them into production and use them. Uh, and maybe the military can use them. So he wanted wheels. It would have been lighter and simpler to just uh, to just have it land on skids. But this is the nose one. This is also the Achilles. Uh, this is the Achilles tendon of the X1. It had a really vicious slap down when the uh, when the elevator stalled, and so all pilots except two who flew the X1s the whole series. Only two pilots never broke uh, never broke the nose gear, and their names are Chuck Yeager and Scott Crossfield. Everybody else damaged the nose gear would send it back uh, send it back for repairs. The nose wheel uh, has a 16 inch tire. Although there was a thought for its design for ground takeoff, for ground launch, there was only one flight, January 5th, 1949, when Chuck Yeager does a conventional ground takeoff, makes an unofficial climb record of more than 13,000 feet a minute, and does get to Mach 1.03. And, uh, and then at altitude, out of fuel, it was a press event, and he just flies orbits around the, 
orbits around the lake bed just for the ground tubes. Intended for ground takeoff, here's the main gear. And you got the main gear. It has a 24-inch tire, and this is the this is the handle in the cockpit. Uh, you could retract the gear and extend the gear, but in practice, when you took off into the B-29, the gear was already up. You weren't retracting the gear. All you had to worry about was getting it down. X-1 was, uh, was highly, highly, highly instrumented. They had 500 pounds of instrumentation. They carried about a dozen of these toaster-sized instruments right over the wing. And it was, uh, and it was control force data, pressure data, loads data on the wing. So the X-1 was essentially a flying loads lab and flying wind tunnel. It was getting both kinds of data. And this, again, this was uh, taken care of by, uh, by the NACA. That was, they were all about the data. Uh, the Air Force brought them in on the program, on the flight program as a partner in December 1945. Uh, the business end of the X-1, a reaction motors XLR-11 engine. It was the little engine that could. It was 19 inches wide, 60 inches long. It was made out of stainless steel. It weighed 210 pounds, and it made about 10,000 horsepower. Now, remember, the X-1 is about the size of a fighter plane, World War II fighter planes. You have 1,500 horsepower with a Merlin or an Allison, and 2,000 horsepower with an R-2800. This is 10,000 horsepower, which is about the same as what the B-29 mothership has. So this is straight wing brute force. We don't want to do anything tricky. We just want to get fast and get data. So this was, uh, this was the machine that did that. Uh, they used 311 gallons of liquid oxygen. That's 3,000 pounds. 293 gallons of ethanol, alcohol, and water mix. This was a regeneratively cooled engine. And uh, rejected for the sake of safety, there was a thought that they could do rotojet engine, which ran on hypergolic fuel, which was, uh, which was fumic nitric acid and aniline. And when the Bell guys were going, do we go with the Aerojet engine or do we go with this one? Uh, they went to the drugstore. They got two glass bottles of these uh, highly unstable, highly toxic materials. They taped the two glass, glass bottles together. They went off to the edge of the parking lot and they threw it and broke it on a rock. And hypergolic stuff ignites on contact. And the fireball was really impressive. And they said, oh, uh, we're going to go with the XLR. <laughs> so that was how that worked. So the first flight, uh, the first flight of this engine is, uh, is on the NACA X-1 flown December 9th, 1946 by Slick Goodland. This is that, this is that flight. And uh, so, that's, uh, so that is not Glenys, that's, uh, that's Slick Goodland, the Bell pilot. And you can also see 1946 because there is no little red stripe in the middle of the national insignia. There's always, there's always Easter eggs buried in the photos of, well, when was this one taken? So that was the first flight of that. The, the final flight of an XLR-11 engine is in, uh, is in the X-24 lifting body, 1975, flown by Bill Dana. So these engines were flown for three decades. They flew in the X-1, the D-558 Skyrocket, the early X-15 had a pair of these because, uh, because the XLR-99 wasn't ready yet. And they were in the lifting bodies, the HL-10, the M2, F2, the M2, F3, the X-24A, the X-24B. So it really was the little engine that could. Okay, to get in the backstory a little bit, the backstory for compressibility effects. 1687, Isaac Newton calculates the speed of sound within about 15%, which is pretty good when you figure what he has to work with. Uh, 1742, years after that, Benjamin Robbins is doing... Uh, doing artillery studies and comes up with the projectile drag rise and he realizes that something is going on because it's not the velocity squared, it's the velocity cubed. And they're going, well, what's with that? Uh, sound wave propagation is correctly calculated in 1820. So you can just see this is just these incremental steps. Uh, the one that fascinates me most, and I'll, and I'll show you a picture at the end. Ernst Mach, for whom we uh, we have named the speed of sound. Ernst Mach takes a shockwave image of a bullet in 1887 without the benefit of any electronic timing. He gets, uh, he gets a picture of a bullet in, uh, uh, in a supersonic flow. And, uh, and so that's our, first, that's our first flaring picture of shockwave. 1918, uh, after World War I, uh, propeller efficiency uh, goes down as you as you spin the propeller faster, and that's when they discovered uh, the critical Mach number in the drag rise, and that's the uh, and that's the Army Air Service. 
And then National Bureau of Standards, a guy named Hugh Dryden, uh, you might have heard of, and Lyman Briggs, uh, they, uh, they start to understand propeller compressibility effects. There's five years of data uh, that they look at to understand flow separation and what's happening on a, on a propeller. Remember, a propeller is a rotating wing. Uh, a propeller at transonic speeds starts to mimic the behavior of a wing at transonic speeds, so they know something is happening. John Stenn, uh, NACA researcher, influenced by uh, the, the Schneider Cup uh, seaplane races in, uh, in the 1920s, uh, comes up with a proposal for a high-speed research airplane. He thinks that if you get uh, if you get the right Rolls-Royce high-performance engine and you put it uh, and you put it in a clean airframe, then you should be able to get to 566 miles an hour, which is not supersonic. It's not even really transonic, but it's fast enough to start studying these effects. So he says, maybe we need to build an airplane to do this. And then in 1934, the next year, he gets a Schlieren shockwave image of what does a shockwave do to an airfoil. He gets that in a wind tunnel. Then in 1940, they realize that their wind tunnels are not giving them uh, any data from 0.8 to 1.3 Mach. So they know they have this tunnel gap. And then 1941, the first U.S. fatality from tuck under compressibility effects, that's Ralph Verdon who dies in a Lockheed YP-38. So that's kind, of, uh, that's kind of how we got there to the point of, oh, let's build an airplane. 1934, John Stack recommends uh, building a transonic research airplane to study and resolve the issues of compressibility. This is significant because the NACA is not allowed to build airplanes in-house. They're always going to U.S. industry to do these things. Uh, December 18, 1943, there was a custom between the U.S. and the U.K. that we would exchange aeronautical lecturers uh, on, on Wright Brothers Day, and there would be a Wright Brothers lecture given here in the U.S. by a Brit, and there would be a U.S. lecture in the U.K. doing a December 17th lecture there. So uh, the, the Royal Aeronautical Establishment's lecture, W.S. Farron, meets at the NACA with, uh, with uh, U.S.'s uh, R&D leaders, and, uh, and Bell's Robert Wolf proposes a transonic, uh, a transonic research aircraft. Maybe we need to build an airplane to start to study this March 16, 1944, Langley has a meeting that marks the origins for the two-fold approach between the Navy and the Air Force for, uh, for building high-speed research airplanes, and they're both going to rely on the NACA for technical uh, support and guidance. Uh, so John Stack's proposed research airplane uh, looks like this. It's uh, kind of a back-of-the-envelope sketch, uh, but, uh, but you start to see here's a straight wing uh, it's not, it, it is a low tail, it's not a high tail, but this is kind of what you start with, with, uh, with, uh, you know, the origins of the, uh, of what turns into the X-Line. The Navy and the NACA had a different, uh, had a different set of goals than the Air Force did. Uh, the Air Force wanted to fly fast, they wanted to fly supersonic, uh, and, uh, and the Navy, on the other hand, is trying to figure out how do you get uh, how do you get a fast jet airplane onto uh, you know uh, how are you going to land on a carrier deck? They cared about they cared about landing on a carrier deck. What could you transition to? Uh, what could you transition to uh, uh, to a production airplane? So they had a very conservative approach. The NACA cared more about the low end of transonic uh, the, the transonic problem. Because they figured you can't get to Mach one without going through all of the all of these transonic perturbations, so they really cared about the first half of the problem more than they cared about the second half of the problem. So this was so this image was reflective of uh, of uh, how the Navy and the NACA wanted to do this, and the Navy and the uh, the NACA had. Uh, had a traditional close relationship with the Navy. They were, uh, uh, the Navy was, uh, the, you know, the Navy between Anacostia and, uh, and Washington, D.C. Uh, and Hampton, Virginia, there was always, uh, there was always a close geographical connection, a close philosophical connection. And remember, the NACA is created as a writer on the Navy Appropriations Bill in 1915. So, uh, so there has always been this close relationship there. Uh, the Navy, uh, the Navy funds uh, the the Douglas D five five eight one Sky Street, and with this turbojet engine, uh, uh, with this turbojet engine, what you get is minutes of data on condition, 
instead of seconds of data like you got with the Bell X1. Bell X1 had uh, two and a half minutes of feed. And so, uh, and so two and a half minutes, uh, you were done accelerating, you were on your way home. So, uh, so this, was, this was a much more useful transonic data gathering airplane than the Bell X1 ever was. The Bell X1 did the high speed data points this airplane did the heavy lifting, but because uh, because the Navy just left the company designation on it, and the Air Force had a better uh, uh, public relations operation and created X designations for its airplanes, mm -hmm. this always gets left out of the sequence. So you never will really hear about this airplane. One minute. Uh, but uh, August fifteenth, nineteen forty-seven. Remember, October nineteen forty-seven. Jaeger flies, breaks the sound barrier, so nobody ever hears about this world speed record. But it's uh, uh, but the sky streak, uh, the sky streak flies uh, in the month of August 1947 and sets a series of of speed records. Speed records were good for uh, were good for publicity for the company. They were good for uh, good publicity for the uh, for the branch of the military that was funding it. So uh, so. Uh, Turner Caldwell flies and sets a speed record with, uh, with this airplane, with the D558, and he takes the speed record away from Chuck Yeager's boss, Al Boyd, who was flying a modified P80R. And, uh, and Al Boyd took the speed record away from uh, a Brit pilot flying a Gloucester Meteor. So it was this constant, you know, it was this constant capture the flag thing. Somebody always, somebody always stole it next. And so this particular flight, August 25th, that's Mary and Carl taking the record away from the Navy guy Carl, uh, Caldwell Turner. So, so this is a so this is a uh, so this is a significant research airplane. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, the Air Force wants to have a rocket-propelled supersonic airplane. Ezra Kotcher had been uh, had been on the XP-79 program with Northrop, which was supposed to be a rocket-propelled interceptor. Uh, again, with that Aerojet aniline nitric acid kind of an engine, uh, it was never built. But he had already gotten a taste of what a rocket engine could do for you, so that so the Air Force was dialed in on we'd like a rocket airplane. One more. So the X uh, the X one. It's a pragmatic design. It's a straight wing because they only wanted to solve one set of problems at a time, and sweeping the wing was a second set of problems, things that they didn't understand. So uh, so they said uh, we just need to get fast. 18G load limit we talked about because uh, some of these diving fighter planes would break up in flight. Rather, you know, they would break up before they hit the ground. 50 caliber body shape we talked about. Adjustable tail we talked about. 500 pound instrumentation package goes right here over the wing. And again, it was intended originally for ground takeoff. Twice as strong as any contemporary airframe. A 7G load was for fighters. The NACA took. Uh, a fighter prototype from uh, uh, from Curtis. Uh, it was uh, what what can you do with a radial engine and the P40? And the answer was not this. So the airplane was available, and so they put an all moving tail on it that you see here. Uh, here was the original surfaces. They put this all moving tail on it because they already knew that uh, that there were elevator control problems, and they thought maybe an all moving tail. Uh, was worth investigating, and so they did that on this XP-42. That's where their confidence came for requiring Bell to make that tail all moving. And oh, by the way, on the uh, D-558, the uh, same thing for Douglas, the tail was all moving. Uh, 500 pounds of instrumentation, this is what it looks like. These are all those toaster-sized pressure transducers, strain force, and they also had a telemetry package, so if they lost the airplane in flight, they at least got some data from the flight, and they could, uh, they could reverse engineer that. And here's a, a more detailed explanation. There's some versions of this where it's classified secret. One more. The X1 had a high pressure fuel system because it was designed and it was intended to have a turbo pump to provide the, uh, the liquid oxygen and, uh, and alcohol fuel to this little rocket engine. The turbo pump was slow in coming. And so as a workaround, Bell put a series of nitrogen spheres in this. When Chuck Yeager tells the story and says, oh, I, uh, I'm, I'm used to uh, gas pressure systems from the uh, from the natural gas fields of West Virginia. Uh, it was an artifact of putting all of these uh, putting all of these high pressure nitrogen spheres to run uh, to run the system. The issue with doing that was they increased the empty weight of the X1 by one ton. X1 became uh, became 2,000 pounds heavier on landing 
because uh, because you didn't jettison this when you when you expanded the fuel. And the other thing it did was it took up volume inside the airframe, and so they went from four and a half minutes of flight under power to two and a half minutes of flight under power. Okay, uh, and air launch proves to be essential out of necessity because. Uh, because the X-1 had just enough fuel to get up to 43,000 feet where they wanted to make the, the, the speed runs. So they had, to, uh, they had to carry these to altitude under the bomber. The Navy didn't like this because it looked dangerous. Uh, the NACA didn't like it because it looked dangerous. Uh, in truth, the first fatality out of this comes from uh, uh, Tick Lilly dies in May of 1948. When, uh, when the turbine uh, in the turbojet engine on the D558 uh, uh, fails and cuts all his control cables, he's low altitude and, uh, and has no ejection seat. And oh, by the way, you can't open the canopy in flight either. So, uh, so that was, uh, so uh, the X-1 looked dangerous, but nobody ever died in an X-1. Okay, so here's, uh, here's the Chuck Yeager picture that we're all familiar with. And, uh, and most people think of the X-1 as one airframe, one flight, one pilot. But in reality, between 1946 and 1950, when this airplane retires, it makes 78 flights. It's flown by 10 pilots. Uh, Jack Willems, Slick Goodland, Chuck Yeager, Al Boyd, Frank Everest, James Fitzgerald, Patrick Fleming, Richard Johnson, uh, Gus Lindquist and Jack Ridley. Uh, Jack Ridley uh, gets to fly the X-1. At this point, Bob Hoover never gets to fly the X-1. He has a high-speed bailout and a jet breaks both legs. He's in the hospital. He never gets to fly the X-1. <laughs> Ultimately, uh, the Air Force announces that yes, indeed, uh, they did. Uh, they did fly supersonically. Those announcements come in the summer of 1948, after the story is broken. Uh, the X-1 gets the Collier Trophy, John Stack gets to represent uh, the NACA, Larry Bell gets to represent his company, and, uh, and Captain Chuck Yeager gets to accept on behalf of the Air Force. Uh, uh, jet pilot, the last flight of Glamour's Glenis is, with no markings, for the Howard Hughes movie Jet Pilot. Chuck Yeager pilots the X-1. All the markings are painted out because it is now simulating a Russian research effort. Uh, the Russians allegedly have uh, a rocket plane. They have a captured B-29, and so they are starting to follow in our footsteps. And I saw this movie when I was a preschooler. Interestingly enough, uh, 1950 flight for this. The movie is released in 1957, so Howard Hughes tinkered with this for a long time, long enough for all this cutting-edge technology to now be kind of old and, uh, and, no, longer, uh, and no longer quite as compelling. Uh, the art imitates life thing is in 1946, the Russians actually had uh, a rocket airplane that they did launch from a captured B-29. Uh, they had a B-29 that was flak damaged over Japan, landed, in, uh, landed in, in Siberia. The Russians fixed it and they did use it for a mothership. And, uh, and their rocket plane actually did have a swept wing. Uh, but it didn't have the all-moving tail. It, it didn't. And it uh, it never worked all that well. If they had worked a little harder, they might have been the people uh, to go supersonic first. The year that I started first grade, this is how I saw the X-1. It was in a tin shed annex at the Smithsonian. Uh, Two-tone markings. One more. 50th anniversary of the Mach 1 flight. There was a big, uh, uh, big celebration at Edwards Air Force Base. There was a stamp. Uh, Chuck Eager flies, uh, flies an F-15, breaks not. On October 2nd, before that, uh, before that 50th anniversary, he is at the Smithsonian, and, uh, and, since, uh, and since Charles Lindbergh had gotten into the cockpit of the Spirit of St. Louis while it was on display in the Smithsonian, Yeager was able to convince, uh, was able to convince Don Lopez, the deputy director of the Smithsonian, it would be a good idea uh, if they put him in a cherry picker and let him get back in the cockpit again. I was privileged to be uh, standing there before hours with the uh, with the museum staff watching this happen. Everybody was a whole lot happier when he got when he got boots on during it. But anyway, so because this is because this is hanging uh, uh, this is hanging at the top you know, up in the ceiling of the Air and Space Museum when he does this. If you're not familiar with the display location, so here he is with the uh, with the F-15 also marked as glamorous glass. Uh, last time General Yeager visits glamorous glass, it's back on the ground. Uh, here it is, October 2015. 
75th anniversary of Mach 1, October 14th, uh, 2022. Uh, it was a much, uh, there was an Edwards Air Show then, and they named the high-speed, uh, the, the high-speed high-altitude supersonic corridor, they named the Bell X-1 supersonic corridor. Major Alex Brick Schuler flew an F-22 uh, supersonic in that at 10.35 in the morning uh, to make that commemoration. Uh, we tend to think of the X-1 as one airframe, one pilot, one flight, see you later, goodbye. And in fact, there, there were six airframes built and it flew in seven different configurations. And the actual tally, six airframes, 28 pilots, 237 flights, 12 years, uh, three were lost to explosions and uh, three are on display today. Uh, this is the one that's in front of the NASA headquarters building. This is 6063 in its final configuration. They cut the wing, uh, they, they, cut, they, they, uh, they, they built a short span wing that was six feet shorter than the original wing. Uh, they put a 3% thick airfoil on it. It was the same airfoil as the Douglas X-3 because they wanted data on that. And that was the first X-plane ever delivered to California. It was uh, the first X-1 to fly under power. It was the last X-1 to fly. And, uh, and if you ever watch I Dream of Gene reruns, uh, you can see it. Uh, you can see it there. Uh, it's not in Cocoa Beach. It's right here in California. Uh, the accomplishments and lessons learned. Uh, between those two airplanes, uh, the first piloted military and civilian supersonic flights, the sound barrier was not a reality. You could fly supersonically. That adjustable horizontal stabilizer was a key factor in the F-86. Uh, the later models of the F-86 had an all-moving tail, and uh, the MiG-15 did not, and that uh, that was a significant uh, that was a significant advantage for them. It validated air launch rocket boost glide return, which you see in the X-15. You see it in the lifting bodies. High altitude, high mock operations. It was how do you use pressure suits? How do you pressurize the cabin? It validated building airplanes to do research with. We have, we've had 75 years going on 76 years of X planes. If the X-1 was not a success, you would not see that. Uh, the last number I saw, I think, was X-67 and it's climbing. And it established flight research protocols for high-speed flight. The people who worked on this program uh, show up later, Walt Williams, uh, was the project engineer at Edwards for the X-1. He went on to be the flight director for Project Mercury for the space flights of Alan Shepard, Gus Grissom, and John Glenn. That's where he goes. Uh, Hartley Soule becomes uh, the, uh, uh, the director of the Worldwide Space Flight Tracking Network. Uh, Gary Trzinski becomes the associate administrator for tracking and data, data acquisition for Project Mercury. This is where the concept for control rooms come from. Uh, this is, uh, so all of these things flow directly into uh, the agency that goes from NACA to NASA, the shift from, uh, from aeronautical flight in the atmosphere to space flight out of the atmosphere. The Schlieren shockwave photography. Here's Ernst Mach's 1887 photo, shockwaves on a bullet. Here's John Stack's. Uh, here's John Stack's shockwaves uh, on an airfoil. Uh, and we are now currently uh, using a lot of computer processing that lets us image shockwaves of an aircraft in flight. So it's no longer inside a wind tunnel with a light source. It's in flight. And here is, uh, and here is a transonic uh, T-38. Here is a supersonic T-38, so you can see uh, the nose shock, uh, the inlet shocks, the wing shock, the tail shocks. And, uh, and so this is now state of the art. Uh, interesting to me, uh, every time somebody shows you these pictures, they're always using a T-38. And it's because anything else that can fly that fast that we can get this imagery on, and we have. One of the stories that, uh, that has gotten traction, and it's just an endlessly repeated fractured fairy tale, because October 14th, 1997, uh, on the anniversary of the of the uh, uh, of the supersonic flight here, PBS in the U.S. rebroadcasts a documentary that was made in the U.K. In that, a number of outrageous claims are made. Go forward one more. The Miles M52 project. The Miles M52 is an afterburning turbojet project with an all-moving tail, 
a biconvex wing different than the NA, uh, different than the NACA airframe. It was canceled in the spring of 1946. The cancellation was devastating for the uh, the British aerospace industry. It was a serious setback to their transonic and supersonic RDT&E. It took them a full decade to catch up to the United States after they canceled this. Fifty years after all of this happens, they're still angry. They are still hurt. Dennis Bancroft, the chief aerodynamicist of Lyons, 50 years later, uh, tells the story that, oh, well, the Air Ministry signed an agreement to exchange high-speed data with the U.S. Bell aircraft personnel visited Miles in 1944. We gave them access to everything on the M-52, and they never gave us anything back. And uh, the, U the U.S. reneged on the agreement, and they were uh, and they were so dumb they were building their airplane with a conventional tail until we told them that it had to be an all-moving tail. So this is a disappointed, angry person with his version of the story 50 years later. None of these things happened. That's the problem. None of these things happened except that it was canceled. It was canceled in 1946. It devastated the British uh, aerospace industry. Uh, it was not their only dumb decision from the labor government. The labor government thought it was a good idea to sell their top engine technology, the Rolls-Royce Dean, to the Russians, and we see them in MIGs. You know, so, uh, you know, so that wasn't their only bad idea. This was another canceling. This was really bad. They were really disappointed with that. But uh, but every British publication that you find, Peter, da Peter Davies in the Osprey uh, uh, publication series, that Nova special that shows up, this gets repeated over and over again. The truth is, no such records have ever shown up. Uh, Dick Hallian, who became the chief historian for the United States Air Force, says, we have no record of any technical exchange agreement. Uh, the Bell team never visited the UK in 1944. Wartime England, there's still U-boats. He didn't just randomly cross the ocean. Uh, there was no exchange. None of these things happened. There was one U.S. visitor in the summer of 1945, Warren Europe is over. It's Captain John Ide, who is the U.S. Naval Technical Attaché in the UK. He is uh, part of the NACA effort, and he does tour Miles to see what Miles has. And he has a one day visit. He makes a rough sketch on the back of an envelope. He sends that on ahead. The summer of 1945, the X1 is already designed. It's completely designed and it is well into fabrication. Uh, and uh, the X1 was completed and delivered before they had ever finished, uh, finished the outer mold line on the M52. So, uh, and again, the British take credit for the all moving tail that shows up on the Curtis XP 42. So, the Bell X1 was a 100% US product start to finish. So, um, so where, I promised I, where I promised I would tell you about some of the fractured fairy tale things that people attach to this, I wanted to get to this one. Uh, with that, uh, I really will stop talking and answer your questions. Uh, that's the once in future home of uh, glamorous goodness. It will go back to the museum downtown. Right now, it's at Uberhazi on the gear. If you would like to go see it. Prophet, Mr. Sculpus? No. Yes, that's why. The Cardina stand failure. You don't have to be 29, so you're all the same things. Yeah, exactly. Uh, that's the truth. Yeah, absolutely. That was a good one. I'm not sure.